Let me start this morning by asking a good question. Why do some people hear the good news of the gospel and believe while others don't? Why do some people hear the good news and they just believe? And then other people, they hear the good news and they don't. One person who's intelligent and observant and they hear about Jesus, they look at the evidence and they, they scoff at it. And they say, the Bible makes no sense, it's ridiculous. And another person equally as intelligent and observant hears the good news about Jesus, comes to believe in him, and hungers for more from the Bible. How do we explain the difference there? Is one guy just smarter than the other or wiser than the other? No. Is one person more spiritual than the other? No. So how do we explain this, this spectrum of responses, these wide differences in the way people respond to the gospel. It is a very important question to consider for a whole bunch of reasons, and it's the subject of what we're going to study this morning in John chapter 6. So grab your Bibles, and let's open to that chapter, John chapter 6. Now for me, it feels like we haven't been in John in like two years, but I think it's only been four weeks, right guys? Something like that? Feels like a long time. This this past month for, for me and my family has been, it's just been wild. It's been filled with busyness and filled with uh, commitments and filled with uh, all kinds of testing as well, hard things. Uh, first, there was the joy in being able to do a couple of great weddings for Oak Hill members. That is always fun. But then mixed in with that was the sorrow of, of losing my dad, which I shared with you guys a couple weeks ago. And then, I don't know if you heard the story, but last week, Uh, On Friday afternoon, I ended up in the emergency room at Henry Mayo with kidney stones. And I'll spare you the gruesome details (laughs) on how that ended up. Um, (laughs) But that happened at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. So it was so funny. Uh, I'm doubled over in pain. Tanya's trying to get me to the hospital. And meanwhile, she's trying to text Grant and Adam to say, Jeff is definitely not in the mix this Sunday. (laughs) Uh, He is not going to be there. So They did a fantastic job, those guys, in less than 48 hours to put together a worship service last Sunday that was incredibly edifying. So this is just a good chance for me to personally thank all of my fellow elders for all of the work that you guys have done in this this last month, filling this pulpit and doing it so well. Jeff Steele four weeks ago, and then our elder panel where we all taught, and then then Adam doing an amazing job uh, in a pinch, literally, in a pinch just getting in there and, and preaching God's Word. So I thank you, brothers, for... For all your work. I appreciate it. Now, let's be reminded of where we left off four weeks ago when we were in John chapter 6. We ended at verse 36. And this is definitely a low point in the narrative. Even after following after Jesus, literally following after him wherever he goes, and hearing him teach and seeing his miraculous power, these crowds of fellow Jews are not believing in him. And again, when you read that, the question is the reader should be, well, why? How, how is that possible that they're seeing and hearing all these things, yet they're not believing? So how is it possible for people, I mean, to literally see this astonishing miracle and just say, yeah, that's not enough for me? How do you explain that? Here, here's a dangerous follow-up question. Does the failure of those Jews in Galilee cast doubt on the success of Jesus' mission? Some people have asked that question. Maybe you've never thought of it this way, but consider this fact. Jesus' stated mission was to seek and save the lost, right? But by the time he left this earth, he had only a small band of followers, right? The vast majority of people that Jesus came into contact with during his ministry continued to be lost after he left. Interesting, right? And so what about today? Further question. 2,000 years later, most of the people on this planet are, are unbelievers. They have not trusted in Jesus. Even though his name has gone out to the ends of the earth, the vast majority of people have not believed in him. Is there a reason to doubt that Jesus really is the Savior of the entire world? Skeptics ask these questions, right? Because when we look at it through human eyes, the stated goal and the results, we say, well, wait, hold on a second. Was Jesus a success? In what he was doing. Well, here's the thing. In our text for today, Jesus is going to tell us why, why 
The same two people who hear the same thing, right? See the same thing, hear the same thing, even see miracles, how they can have such different responses. And what he's going to teach us this morning has massive implications for our walk with him, for our worldview, for the way we worship, for the way we pray, for how we fulfill the Great Commission. John chapter 6 is key, and we're only going to say a little bit about it today because there's so much to be said, but the rest of this chapter has massive implications for the way we view our walk with him. So, fair warning, in this passage, Jesus is about to deal with the subject of God's sovereign election. A challenging subject for sure. And again, I can't say everything that I'd like to say in one morning, but this is going to keep going through the rest of chapter 6. But one of the reasons why we prefer at Oak Hill a heavy diet of expository preaching, just teaching through the books of the Bible as we come along, is because when we do that, we end up studying everything that God has to say, not just the things we like. A lot of churches are out there doing that. You know, we're going to skip over the hard stuff and just concentrate on the things that we like. But when you set out to preach the whole counsel of God, inevitably you come up against difficult passages. And you come up against deep theological ideas that really bend the mind to try to understand and, and challenge the heart. So I want you to know before we jump into this, and this is going to last a couple of weeks, I'm not out searching for controversy. I'm not planning, hey, let's just throw this out there and really, really just stir up a controversy so that people get upset. But when hard things come up in the text, we trust that God has a reason for this. So my advice as we dive into this today in the next couple of weeks is let's learn together. And let's submit, let's submit our biases, let's submit our human wisdom and exchange it for divine wisdom with the expectation that the Holy Spirit's going to teach us together. Amen? Ooh, I I, I felt like you were holding back a little bit there. (laughs) Try it again? Okay, so we're, we're going to submit our human wisdom to God's divine wisdom. We're going to dive into the text and really try to root out what it says with the expectation that the Spirit's going to guide us into truth together. Amen? All right, beautiful. Good. All right, it's been a while since we've been in John 6, so let's back up to verse 24, and let's, let's summarize what we've just learned before we took this four-week break. Remember, Jesus has just done this amazing miracle, right? He has, he has fed a crowd, not just 5,000, but probably somewhere around 20,000 men, women, and children from what? Two lake fish and five loaves of barley. That's, that's crazy. That is an astonishing miracle where Jesus is actually creating physical matter, ex nihilo, right? Or at, at the very least, multiplying the small amount of matter into a massive volume of food. Amazing stuff, right? So now, knowing, after doing this miracle, the wicked intentions of the hearts of this crowd, in the middle of the night, The the gospel writers say in the third watch of the night, Jesus escapes the crowds, right? What does he do? He goes out, he breaks all the laws of physics, walks across the Sea of Galilee in front of his disciples, gets into their boat, and brings them safely to the shore of Capernaum. And we covered that. Go back and you can listen to those sermons. We talk about those miracles, right? So they're in Capernaum now, and when the sun comes up the next day, the people are looking for Jesus, and they realize what? He's gone. Somehow he's gone. Didn't need a boat, but somehow he's gone. So we pick up the story in verse 24. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats, and they came to Capernaum, listen, seeking Jesus. They pursued him. Interesting, right? They're not going to believe, but they're pursuing him. For what reason? We're going to find out. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Right? They're at least curious. How did you get here? Because you didn't take a boat. Jesus answered them, right? By the way, Jesus is not going to explain, right? He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Jesus says, You guys are still thinking just materially, physically, and not spiritually. So he exhorts them in verse 27 Do not work for the food which perishes. That's the physical food. Don't work for that stuff, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Did you hear the offer in that? Which the Son of Man will give to you, for on, the, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do? So that we may work the works of God, or perform the works of God. 
And I look at that and I go, that's not a bad question, right? Rabbi, tell us what should we do then? Okay, good question. But look at Jesus' surprising response in verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, singular, the one work of God which pleases him, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Again, what an offer, right? Just believe. Just believe. Now, here comes their massive failure. Verse 30. Verse 30 is where it turns, where they're going from a good question to a massive failure. Verse 30. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They tested the Savior, didn't they? Perform for us, Jesus. Do another miracle. Fill our bellies again. And then they have the audacity to try to compare him to Moses. Verse 31. Listen, Jesus, our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. It's as if they're looking at Jesus and saying, well, look, Moses, he fed the whole nation of Israel every day for 40 years. You, you did it for one day. So keep going. We want more, and then we'll believe, right? How many of you guys believe that, that they'll believe if Jesus just keeps feeding them? Of course not, right? And, and I look, by the way, I look at that and I think, I, I would not have this patience that Jesus has here with these people, right? I, all of us, we would just zap button, bzz, smite button, like, I'm, I'm done with you guys, right? But the Lord is patient. I'm glad he's not like me. So he corrects their understanding. Verse 32, Jesus said, said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. So these folks are doing what, what we all tend to do. They were looking at the human leadership, right, and ascribing the, the greatness to the human leadership, but completely missing the one who's actually providing the manna. And more importantly, Jesus now points them to true bread from heaven, not just physical manna, but something much, much greater. Verse 33, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Catch that. Whatever this bread, of, uh, bread of, of God is, it gives life. So it can't just be physical manna, right? Because we all eat and get hungry again. This actually gives life. And it's offered here not just to Israel in the wilderness, but to the entire world. But still they don't catch it, right? They're clueless. Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And so we're seeing a pattern here from Nicodemus to the Samaritan woman at the well, and now this crowd, they're just thinking in terms of physical stuff. Literal birth, literal water, and now we have literal bread. Give us this bread, Jesus, so that we're constantly full, so that we don't have to ever feel hungry. Now, verse 35, for the first time, Jesus now explicitly says, hey, I'm talking about myself here. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now, you would think, as a reader, this would be the high point of the narrative. Jesus is standing there. You can sort of picture him saying, guys, look, I am this bread. Believe in me. Come to me. Eat. Feed. He's standing there, and he's offering it, right? And, and the reader would expect at this point, how can they not see the beauty of this offer? How can they not just fall on their knees and accept the offer? But the opposite happens. This is the heartbreaking part. Verse 36. Jesus said, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Jesus knows their hearts. They, they can see physically with their eyes, but they're still blind. In fact, what we're going to find out is that they're unable to see. And Jesus knows this as well. Friends, if you want to understand how sovereignty works in salvation, this is a concept that you need to process through in your heart and your mind, this idea of ability and inability of a natural man. What is, it na what is natural man capable of? What, what abilities or inabilities does he have related to his salvation? You have to look at Scripture and answer this question. Does a man have the ability by his own will and apart from God to turn to God and be saved? Or is he unable to incline himself toward God apart from, you know, on his own and be saved? Is he, is he unable to do that? These are key questions to really understanding how salvation works and the role that God plays and the role that we play. So this is where we left off four weeks ago with this heartbreaking picture of God offering the gift, the bread of life, 
only to be met with unbelief. And we knew this was coming back in John chapter 1. It said, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. So as we move forward in the text now, I want to do is break it into this next uh, section of the passage, into two sections, and we're just going to walk through the logic of Jesus' argument. Let's look at verses 37 to 40. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me, Jesus says, or everyone, you may, it might say in your translation, everyone that the Father gives me will come to me, he says. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not or never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son or looks upon the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Now, that's a whole bunch of words, and it feels kind of repetitive, right? And, and like he, he's sort of circling around it a whole bunch of times. But the logic's really very simple. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. This section of John 6 is filled with a number of important certainties. You heard the word will a whole bunch of times. This will happen. A whole bunch of certainties. And the reason why they're certain is because they're secured by the sovereign power of God. This is why at Oak Hill we... We, we, we tend to shy away from the term Calvinist because we know how that just stirs up controversy, although I'm not afraid or ashamed to say I'm a Calvinist. We talk about being sovereigntists, that God is sovereign over all things. All these certainties that are discussed here are secured by the fact that God is sovereign over all things. So let's look at these things. I, I think we've got six of them. Oh, wow. There it is. Good. Certainties in John chapter 6, the first one that Jesus has come down from heaven to accomplish his Father's will. His Father's will is is certain, right? Now, it's easy to become so familiar with that statement that you see on the screen that we blow right past it without realizing just how hard it would have been for these Jews in that day to accept Jesus' words. Again, put yourself in their sandals. If, If you heard a man say this to you, I came down from heaven to do my Father's will, how would you respond to that? And if you take a peek down at verse 46 real fast, you see that Jesus is going to double down on this. Imagine somebody says, hey, by the way, my origins are in heaven. You'd go, excuse me? (laughs) What? But he doubles down in verse 46. He says, I am from God. I have seen God, Jesus claims. Meaning I've been in his presence. That, That is a wild statement for a Jew to make, isn't it? Not even Moses could make that statement, right? Remember the story on Mount Sinai? How he wants to see the glory of God? But Jesus says, I've been in the presence of God. That's a wild statement. It's exactly that statement is what is going to fuel the opposition that we're going to see from the Jews in the coming verses. So Jesus is saying here, I've been with God. He sent me from heaven to you, and I have one single solitary goal in everything that I do, and that is to accomplish His will to do everything that he has given me to do. And that is the basis for how Jesus defines success in his mission. So earlier I asked the question, does the failure of these Jews in Galilee to believe in him cast doubt on Jesus' mission? And the obvious answer is no, because the basis for his success was not on how silly human beings responded to him. That's not how we judge the success of the mission. The success is judged on whether Jesus accomplishes everything the Father has given him to do, period. And listen, we have to get, through this, get this through our thick heads because we're so American and we're so Western and we have a certain view of what success is. Jesus didn't walk the earth on a public relations tour. Now, we might have arranged it that way. Some of you guys, you, you do this for a living. You're like, I could have promoted this. I mean, we could have been big in Galilee. But this wasn't Jesus' goal. He had no intention of building a giant following. That was not the goal. The goal was the Father's will, period, period. So how sovereign does God claim to be? You want to know how sovereign God claims to be in terms of his will? Look at Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. This 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 is what we have to work with in terms of the Hebrew Scriptures. 
God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. That way, right? The end from the beginning, right? I, I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Because God is outside of time and space, he sees it all as one thing. From the first day of creation to the, to the last day of this planet, he sees it as one thing. He declares the beginning from the end, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established. It will be. It's certain. All my purposes, my great decree, right, that I, that I declared long before the world was made, my purposes will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. That's what Jesus came to do, the Father's will. That's number one. Second certainty is this. Boom. That the Father has given to the Son, this is a hard one now, the Father has given to the Son a chosen subset of humanity to save. Not everybody. A chosen subset of this massive volume of humanity that He will save. Look at verse 37 again. What you're going to see here is both a general universal truth and then a specific localized truth. It's very important to see both of them. Here's the first one. All people or everyone that the Father gives to the Son will come to Him in faith. That's a reference to the full universal body of Christ, true believers from every age, from every race, tribe, and language, chosen to be saved before the foundations of the world were ever laid. But then the second half of the verse narrows it, and it individualizes it. And the one who comes to me, the one, every unique person who believes in me and comes to me, he says, I will never cast out. Big, general, universal, narrow, personalized, and individual. Both are included in verse 37. Now notice, God is not passive in that, right? Can you imagine God sitting back and just going, man, I hope these people will come to Jesus. You'd never see this in the text, although there's a whole bunch of people that really like to teach this idea because they so badly want to see salvation be man-centered that we make this choice. But you don't see God sitting back waiting and hoping that certain people will come to Jesus and believe. No, he's the active giver of the chosen ones to the Son. He actively gives his chosen ones to the Son. And he has to be active in this. If God doesn't take the initiative, none of us would be saved. So he has to be the active one because left to our own fallen will, not one of us would choose on our own to turn to Christ and to submit to him and be saved. Our flesh works against it. We don't want it because we're fallen. Okay, so the Bible tells us that this idea that we can incline ourselves towards God is outside of both our will and our ability. We have to understand that. So God the Father is the great initiator. He chooses, he gives. And by the way, this should be a very encouraging picture. I know it can be hard, and, it, and I know in your mind you're worrying around thinking, yeah, because look, like I said, I'm not going to be able to answer every question about this in one sermon, but I know you got questions. And hopefully we'll get to them at some point. But think of the encouragement here. If you're sitting here this morning and you have believed in Christ, if you have come to him, you you are a precious gift that the Father has marked out. He's given you to Jesus. You are a trophy of His grace. And sometimes we forget that, how special we are in God's eyes, right? We like to beat ourselves up over our sin all the time, right? But you're a precious trophy of God's grace. He's given you to His Son. Now, we're going to see Jesus restate and emphasize this same truth over and over again and over again as we go through John's gospel. We're going to see it in, later in chapter 6 and 8 and 10 and 12. He's going to reinforce this all over the place. But just so that this morning you don't think, well, this is some quirky, isolated text, Jeff. Let me just direct you to John chapter 17. I'm just going to give you a couple of verses because chapter 17 really fits well with what we read here in chapter 6. And I'll just cite two of four or five different places in John 17, which, by the way, is the high priestly prayer, right, where Jesus prays on behalf of his, belief, of his followers. Just going to give you two of the four of these verses, and you'll see the very same language. There it is. Wesley's helping me. Good job, man. John 17, 1 and 2. Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come, right? He's facing crucifixion. The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given to him, 
he may give eternal life. So everyone that you've given to me, Father, I will grant eternal life. You've given them to me. I will now save them. Here's the other one, sort of capping the, the, the end of that chapter. John 17, 24. Now he's speaking of all believers through all ages. And he prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, be with me where I am. Every, every single person that you have given to me, I want them to be where I am, to be with me for all eternity. The Father gives, the Son saves. It's really clear, isn't it? It's, when you start breaking it down, and again, as we go through John, you're going to see it more and more of these truths being reemphasized and strengthened. All right, third great certainty we see here, that everyone that the Father has given to the Son will be saved. Guys, this is not up for grabs. This is not up for debate. It's certain. Because first of all, the Trinitarian persons always work in perfect unity, right? And with one purpose in mind. But second, as we've already seen, the Son is focused on doing the Father's will to its absolute full. That means every single person that's given to Him, He will save. So because the Father gives His elect to the Son, each one will come to saving faith. It's a done deal. And theologians use a phrase that creates all kinds of consternation. They use the phrase irresistible grace when we talk about this. And that just sends people into a frenzy. Irresistible grace. Why? You know why? Because as sinners, we want the freedom to resist. If you tell me I can't resist, I want to resist. I mean, that's who we are as fallen creatures. But we, this drives us crazy. But that phrase is describing a grace that is so beautiful and so amazing that no man or woman would ever not want to have it. You will want it. It's that beautiful. It's that valuable. It's that awesome. And so it's irresistible. Now, it doesn't mean that, and some people dishonestly characterize irresistible grace like this, that God just drags you kicking and screaming into heaven. You didn't really want it, but he's going to drag you there anyway. That is not what's being described here. What it means, and this is so beautiful, and, and I know if, I, if we went around the room, we could all stand up and testify to this. What it means it is these are the things that God has done in the life of the believer. He's moved us from spiritual death to spiritual life. He's made us alive in Christ. He's opened our eyes to see things that we couldn't see before. Can you testify to that? Like, I can in my life. There was things I, I, I couldn't see, I didn't want to see, and then suddenly I'm like, why am I seeing this for the first time? Like, and I'm understanding. Is that, is that your testimony as well? That God took the blinders off and you began to see everything in life differently. This is my favorite one. He changes the affections of our hearts so that things that we never would have loved before, now we love. I mean, how many of us said, man, I really want to submit myself to God? I mean, that, of all the things that I, when I wake up in the morning, you know, as, an, um, as a natural person, we're like, I really want to just give over my will completely and submit to God. No natural person wants to do that. But now my affections are changed. Now I see the beauty in submitting myself to Christ. I want things that I never would have wanted before. It's a beautiful thing. And he causes sinners like you and I, to be willing to come to Jesus. And not just willing like robots, but lovingly come to Jesus in praise and worship because we now see, not just physicalized, but with spiritualized. We see and we understand. And guys, this is what people, this is what unbelievers will never understand because it's something that has to be experienced, right? The world cannot understand this. In fact, they're unable to understand this. And that's why it can be frustrating when you're witnessing, right? You're like, oh, if you could just see what I see. But they can't. Until God does that work in their heart, they're unable to see it. And I could give all kinds of biblical examples of how this works, but the, my favorite one, and because it's so simple, is the story of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. It's so great. Paul preaches the gospel in, in Philippi, and there's this average ordinary businesswoman named Lydia, and it says she's there listening. And what happens? It says that God opened her heart to believe what Paul was saying. Now, she gets saved, but the thing about this story, it's a very simple story. You can read it for yourself in Acts 16. Lydia got so, so much less evidence than the Jews in Galilee. Right? The Jews in Galilee got 
miracles. And they literally followed Jesus around and heard him teach and watched him do these things. Lydia just listens to a verbal presentation from this guy named Paul, and she believes. That's what I was talking about with these different responses. Why over here and why over there? What's happening here? Well, the verse is important, right? There it is. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The father brought Lydia to life. The father took the scales off of her eyes and allowed her to see, and she trusted in him. God did that work. And folks, that is your story, and that's my story too. If you've trusted in Christ, it's only because the father gave you to the son and he opened your heart to believe. He opened your heart to see and to hear and to understand and to believe. That's our story. And, and, the, and the cool thing is, it's, again, it's not robotic. When you came and believed, you came freely. You wanted this. You came freely and lovingly and willingly because he had overcome your resistance by doing this work in your heart. It is a work of God from beginning to end. But never, when we talk about sovereignty, never remove the fact that because our affections are changed, we really wanted to come and to worship Jesus. Amen, right? I mean, that's my story. I hope it's your story as well. It wasn't robotic for me. In fact, it was so not robotic that I began early on in my walk with Jesus to think, oh, I did this. <laughs> I wanted to love Jesus. Well, then you read Scripture and you find it, oh, <laughs> oh, it really wasn't me. He did something in my heart that caused me to feel that way. Okay, I'm good with that. I hope you're good with that. Because there's a big argument in the church about how, well, if you're a sovereignist like this, well, then you believe in robotic theology. Absolutely not. We choose to believe. We willingly believe, but only because he did the work in our hearts. Does that make sense? Okay, just make sure you don't allow people that want to argue against sovereignty to sort of, sort of lay that on you because it's not fair. It's not scriptural. So make sure you understand that. Okay, last two certainties. We'll do these really fast. Number four, all those the Father gives to the Son are then kept by him. This is assurance of salvation, right? I will never cast them out, Jesus says. I will lose none of them. So the choosing and the giving is the Father's sovereign work, but the keeping is the Son's sovereign work, right? The Trinity working together, right? If the Father marks us out for salvation, if He gives us to the Son, Jesus will never turn us away. And He will never reject us. And He will never then let us slip away because it's all secured by the sovereign power of the trinity and what a comfort that is our assurance that we'll be in heaven someday is not based on our power to hold on to jesus because we'd all flunk that it's based on his power to hold on to us which is certain amen last one when the end of all things come all those given to the son will be resurrected to eternal life certain it will happen you see this in both verses 39 and 40. Everyone the Father gives to me, I will keep, Jesus says, and I will raise them up on the last day. Again, the basis for that secure, certain hope is the sovereign will of God. His will never fails. He accomplishes all that he purposes. Amen? Okay, let's get going into our second section because we still have to get to the most important verse in this whole, whole thing. Let's look at verse 41. So, what we've covered already is pretty heavy, isn't it? And so now, we, now we, here's the question we need to ask. Well, how did these Jews in Galilee in that day respond to this really difficult teaching? Well, not well. Anybody surprised? Not well. Verse 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling or muttering, right? They're behind his back. Can you believe this guy, right? They're muttering. They're complaining, and it says, because he said, I'm the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Now look, we do this all the time. We judge people in scripture all the time and go, oh, how, how silly they were, right? It's easy to do that 2,000 years later looking back. But if you step back and honestly analyze the situation, this is a pretty, this, this grumbling's pretty understandable. Right? After all, who, set, who talks like this? You know, who claims that my origin is from heaven? Or, or who's, who has the audacity to say, I'm the bread of life that's come down from God? You and I might mutter just a bit about this. I mean, let's just be honest, right? It, we might be muttering as well. 
what Jesus is claiming here is just too big for these folks. It, it's too exalted for the natural man to hear and believe. And that's Jesus' whole point. They're natural. They're not, they're not saved. God hasn't done a work in their heart. So of course they can't receive this. It's too big. It's too big. They're unable to receive this. Keep in mind also, Jesus grew up in a very specific region, right? We call it Lower Galilee. It's not a big place. It's about 450 square miles, of less than half the size of Rhode Island, Lower Galilee is. So people knew each other. Families knew each other, right? So the people are saying, look, we know who Jesus is. We know exactly where he comes from. We know Nazareth. We're not impressed. Okay? <laughs> we know his fa- We know Mary and Joseph. They're, they're cool people. We know his brothers and sisters. So how can he now say, oh, I'm not from here. I'm from heaven. You, you can sort of understand. For, for a natural person, this is a very valid objection. Now, scholars believe that John uses this word grumbling to make a point, okay? Since the Jews and the crowd were the ones who were making this comparison between Jesus and Moses, John may want us to think back to a similar group of people, very hard-hearted people, who grumbled against Moses' leadership in the wilderness. Remember? They grumbled against him. And what happened? They brought down God's judgment upon themselves. Well, guess what? These grumblers are going to suffer the same fate. So I think that word is intentional here. So, Grumblers, by definition, do not submit themselves to the sovereign will of God. Let me just say that again. And this is believers and believers, outside the church and inside the church. Grumblers are not in submission to God's sovereign rule. They prefer to object to things. They prefer to complain about things. There's always something to complain about. Submission to God and others is very, very difficult for a grumbler. So Jesus is about to rebuke them. Look at verse 43. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. Notice, Jesus doesn't take the time to try to correct their understanding. He's not going to take time to try to explain, well, okay, let me give you the mechanics of how I came out of heaven. He could have, by the way, but he didn't. Instead, he goes straight for their sinful attitude. And he says, stop muttering. Stop it. See, it's no blow to Jesus' ego that they don't believe. I mean, he's not up there, oh, if I just wring in his hands, if only I could convince these people to believe in me. It's not a blow to his ego. It's not a surprise to him. In fact, he knows their hearts. This is what he expects. He knows at this point they're unable, unable to believe in him. That's what he means in verse 44. This is the key passage. Highlight it, underline it, circle it, whatever you want to do in your Bibles. This is the key to understanding God's sovereignty and salvation. By the way, We always talk about Paul in sovereignty, right? Romans 9, Ephesians 1, all these places where he talks about it. You have to understand, and people criticize Paul for this, right? They're like, oh, he's saying things way out of line. He's only building on what Jesus says here in John 6 and other places. So there's no no, uh, break between Paul and Jesus when it comes to this thing. Verse 44, Jesus says, first of all, stop grumbling. And he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How many people will come to Jesus without the Father drawing him? Zero. Oh, we just pray and go home. Right? I mean, that's a strong statement. Zero. Zero human beings will come to Jesus on their own. That's a fact. And again, I can cite all kinds. I'm going to cite some passages. Again, because I don't want you to think I'm just up here you know, picking verses and yanking them out of a context. I'll give you a whole bunch of them. Verse 1, there is none who seeks after God. How many seek after God? Zero. None. Back in John chapter 1, we've already been through it. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, okay, not by their bloodline or by their, their heritage, not of the will of the flesh, in other words, not of their desires, nor the will of man, but born of God. That's the only way you can become a child child of God is if you're born of God. John chapter 3, right? We went the story of Nicodemus, and Jesus was very clear with me. He said, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Unless God does that work and you're born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. And of course, we got to cover Romans 9 real fast, right? Verses 16 and 18, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, 
but on God who has mercy. Salvation is not about the man who wills things or runs after things. It's about God who has mercy. So then he, God, has mercy on whom he desires. He will save whom he will save. We sing the song, don't we? John 15, 16. Jesus says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. I'm in control of this. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I picked you. And now I've appointed you to go out and do the things that I have predestined you to do. Now, in a negative sense, we can look at John 8 as well. And in this context of John 8, again, Jesus is talking to a crowd of stubborn, unbelieving Jews. And he says it this way. Am I, am I, am I with this here? There we go. John 8. He says to them, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot What a powerful word. You cannot hear my word. That's that inability issue. You cannot hear my word because you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. We'll get to that in at least, what, two years? (laughs) Do you see the inability in these things, right? We cannot do this on our own over and over again. So then coming back to our text in John 6, to the crowd, Jesus essentially says, look, I know you cannot accept what I'm saying. I know you can't accept. You're unable to accept it. So you should stop your grumbling because all of the reasoning of fallen men like yourselves is useless when it comes to salvation. You can argue and fight and bicker about this whole thing. It will lead to nothing. You're unable to come to me unless the Father draws you. So stop grumbling and start praying. I think that would be Jesus' advice at this point. Stop your grumbling and start praying that God would do at work in your heart. And when he does, be prepared to submit to him. These guys don't want to do that. Grumblers are always proud of their ideas, right? Their logic and their reasoning. Natural man loves the idea that he's in control of his own destiny. That he can do as he pleases. I can choose to be saved or I can choose not to be saved. That's what the grumbler wants. But guys, the reason Jesus is hammering these Jews in verse 44 is to destroy their pride. This verse obliterates the pride of man. The man who says, I can do this on my own. If I want to be saved, I'll be saved. If I want to submit, I'll submit. Jesus says, no, no. I'm going to knock that, I'm going to pull that rug out from under you and obliterate your pride. That's what Jesus is attacking here in verse 44. Here's here's how J.C. Ryle puts it. This is a great quote. Thanks, Wesley. He says, The Lord desired to magnify their danger and guilt and to make them see that faith in Him was not so easy an affair as they had supposed. It was not knowledge of His origin alone, but the drawing grace of God the Father which they needed. Let them awake to see that and cry for grace before it's too late. Spurgeon himself called this, the the theology that comes out of this verse, the most humbling of all doctrines. Because we're unable. We're unable. Now, what is this drawing? Have you ever, like, what is it, what is that? We sort of know what that means, but what does it actually mean? Eight times in the Greek New Testament, you'll find it, you'll find this word being used. And the one definition you will not find, which is often cited by people who do not like sovereign election, is they will say, well, this drawing is like a wooing. Like a, a, a girl that's trying to you know, get the attention of a boy, or the other way around, right? Just trying to woo that person in. That's not it. That is not what the word means. It's not a passive, hopeful word. It's a power word. You need to understand this. It's a power word. It's used in other places. It's used of dragging a net full of fish into a boat. The fisherman doesn't try to woo the fish. Come, fishy, fishy. <laughs> jump in my boat. No, he, he lifts them out of the water and brings them into the boat. <laughs> These guys are not going to let me forget that. I can already feel it. But you see what I mean? They're not like, come on, fish. No, they're lifting the fish and bringing it into the boat. It's a power word. Same word is used when Paul and Silas are dragged before civil authorities. The magistrate didn't go, boy, I really hope they'll come. Maybe I'll woo them to come to court. No, he ordered them to come to court. That's the word that's being used here, right? So this drawing is a power word. It's always effectual. It always brings to pass exactly what it aims to do. That's God drawing his chosen ones. He makes it happen. 
A.W. Pink, one of my favorite scholars, he says this about it. He says, it's the power of the Holy Spirit overcoming the self-righteousness of the sinner and convicting him of his lost condition. It's the Holy Spirit awakening within him a sense of need. It's the power of the Holy Spirit overcoming the pride of the natural man so that he's ready to come to Christ as an empty-handed beggar. That's the only way we come to God. It's the Holy Spirit creating within him a hunger for the bread of life. That's the drawing of God. That's the work that God does in the heart. That's what we need. That's the only way we can be saved. Make sense? Okay, now next week we're going to look at verse 45, and that's going to give us even more information about this drawing. For now, let me just wrap up with a couple things. Let me give you a picture to look at. Have you ever seen a picture like that? There's an old saying, it goes like this, when you find a turtle on the top of a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. (laughs) And I want you to think about that in terms of salvation. When you see a foolish, rebellious sinner who loves himself and loves his sin and mocks the gospel of Christ, and then later you see him, and that same person is now repenting of his sin and praising God for his mercy and singing worship songs in church, you know he didn't get there by himself. (laughs) Right? It's impossible. For, For a sinner to be able to go from that to that, is as impossible as a turtle climbing up a fence post. All right? Somebody put him there. And we're here to say this morning that the person who put that sinner in church singing those praises was none other than the Father who gave that sinner to the Son. And the Son saved him, and the Son will keep him. Let me just share with you, uh, because I love this, Spurgeon, when he was saved, he went through sort of a, a metamorphosis, as so many of us do to try to understand our own salvation, because we experience salvation very personally, right? And we see it from this narrow lens that we have. And as I said, when we begin to read Scripture, we go, oh, man, it was so much bigger than I thought. Here's, what, here's his testimony, personal testimony. He says, Well can I remember the manner in which I learned the doctrines of grace in a single instant. Born as all of us are by nature, I did not see the grace of God. When I was coming to Christ, I thought I was doing it all myself. I had no idea that the Lord was seeking me. Anybody want to testify to that? One night when I was sitting in the house of God, I wasn't thinking much about the preacher's sermon. That's not good. (laughs) And the thought struck me, how did you come to be a Christian? Well, I answered, I sought the Lord. But how did you come to seek the Lord? He asked himself. Well, the truth flashed across my mind in a moment. I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind that made me seek him. Well, I prayed, I thought. But then I asked myself, how did I come to pray? (laughs) Well, I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. Well, how did I come to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to that? Then in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of all of it, that he was the author of my faith. And so the whole doctrine opened up to me. And from that doctrine, I have not departed to this day. And I desire to make it my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. Do, try that exercise. Well, why did I do this? Well, oh, wait. What caused, me to, what caused me to do that? And take it all the way back and go, oh, oh, it was God seeking me. It's a beautiful picture. And it's true. There were many in Jesus' day. We talked about them, who heard Jesus teach, saw the miracles, and they didn't believe. And we go, how is that possible? But there were others in that day too. And they heard, and they saw the very same things, and they realized, yes, this Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. He is Israel's Messiah. And they believed in Him, and they gave up everything to follow Him. They even suffered greatly for it, and they rejoiced anyway. So we see the two responses. It's still true today. The same thing. When we go out there and share our faith, the same conditions are in effect. One man hears the gospel and comes to Jesus in faith. Another man, no more of a sinner than the first one, right? Do we affirm that? All sinners. He hears the same message and he couldn't care less. In fact, he's offended by it. Why would I have to, you know, repent of my sins? How dare you? I choose my destiny, right? You see stubborn people like this. Same message, two distinctly different results. Why? 
Jesus explained it to us. God has drawn one foolish sinner, and he's chosen not to draw another. Hard truth? Absolutely. Mystery? For sure. So we're going to keep exploring this as we go along. I'm just going to wrap up with this really quick because I feel like I've got to give you just there, one caution as we go out on this. You know, if you're a sovereigntist or maybe you've identified yourself publicly as a Calvinist, you've come out of the closet as a Calvinist. Can I say that? Grant's mad at me. I know. <laughs> I mean, if you've identified yourself as a Calvinist or you talk about sovereignty a lot, you're probably going to be grouped in with some people that are like, you guys are so arrogant. Have you heard, anybody heard that before? You guys are so arrogant. And you know what? A lot of our sovereigntist brothers and sisters, they are arrogant. And we need to be really careful about this. So John Piper's five, very quickly, five effects of God's sovereign grace in salvation. And the first one is the most important. If you're truly a sovereigntist, it should humble you. It shouldn't make you proud or arrogant. It should humble you. Why? Because you were unable to save yourself. How can you be prideful when you did nothing? You can't be. It's wholly a work of God. We are completely dependent on Him. So if it wasn't for His choosing and giving and drawing and keeping, you would never be saved. That is humbling. Number two, it fills us with thankfulness. If you acknowledge that everything you have, including coming to Jesus, that it's all a gift of God, how can you not be a thankful person? Let me shake you for a second. And say, read your Bibles, know your theology. If everything that you have, including your very life, comes from God, and you're not thankful, let's talk outside today. Because you're missing something. Number three, gives us this amazing assurance. Because if, if God drew us to himself in sovereign power, then that same sovereign power holds us. And we don't have to be concerned about our, our future. Number four, we have hope for the conversion of people who we think are well beyond the reach of grace. Because if it depended on us, we would despair over... I, I have friends and family that are so far from the Lord, I would despair every day if it came down to that human being's decision or my ability or lack of ability to share effectively with him. But if I know that God does the work, then there's hope. There's always hope. Because when God calls somebody to life, they come to life. And when he calls his sheep, they hear his voice and come. That's the hope that we have. And then lastly, all glory goes to God and not to us. And that is so important, you guys. This is why God has chosen to save the way he does, so that we might worship and praise him, not just now, but for all eternity. That's why. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory. So, friends, ponder this today. Ponder it tonight. Ponder it tomorrow. Ponder it for every single day that God gives you. Of all the billions of people that have lived on this planet, of all the billions in this world, God the Father marked you out for salvation. We, we ought to just constantly meditate on that truth. He has marked you out. He has given you as a precious gift to His Son. He drew you into a saving relationship. The God of the universe loved you enough to know you right? To mark you out, to give you to the Son, and then to draw you into a relationship with the God of the universe. Ponder that for a moment. That changes the way we think, doesn't it? Doesn't that change the way we view everything in life? I hope it does for you. We just got to keep preaching that to ourselves, reminding ourselves, reminding each other how precious we are to God. Amen? I'm going to give you a few moments of quiet time, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. So let's bow our heads. And you know what? If you're a believer here this morning, man, what a great time to praise him. And if you're not, this is a great time to consider some of the things that we've talked about, that you would pray right now, Lord, do this work in my heart. Draw me to yourself. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you are sovereign over all things, Lord. I, we cannot imagine it being any other way. What a chaotic world we would live in. But Lord, it's, when it comes to salvation, this gets very hard for us. So I, I praise you this morning for this passage of Scripture and what we'll read over the next couple of weeks, the way you have made it so clear to us that we rely upon you to do a work in our hearts. And so help us to understand as much as we can with our finite minds, Lord, to understand your goodness and your love in that. 
And even as questions arise in our hearts about, well, why isn't God doing this or that? That, again, we would seek your face and we would see your goodness to us and your kindness to us. That we would praise and worship you and that we would have a greater sense of our need to pray for the lost people, our need to share our faith with lost people. Because we do know, God, that when you call people to life, they come alive. So thank you for that privilege of joining you in the work of the Great Commission. Lord, we have so much more to say over the next couple weeks. Your spirit is guiding us into truth. We thank you for that. And we look forward to being with you more in the coming weeks. All for your glory, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.